today's topic. So today's topic is handovers in 5G. Before we begin, uh, maybe we can have a show of hands. How many of you are from non-telecom background? So there is a virtual hand. You can raise that. How many are non-telecom? Ralph, OK. Only one person, non-telecom. OK, so most of you are from telecom background, so you will be familiar with the jargon. Uh, Radha Krishnan also from non-telecom. So just a couple of people. So most of you are from telecom background, uh, which is good because I will be using quite a lot of technical jargon, which is really the nature of telecom. Telecom is full of uh, acronyms and uh, jargon. But for those who are from non-telecom, uh, I will start with a very uh, lay person kind of introduction to what handover is. Then I will introduce the technical jargon, not all of it, but the basic stuff. Then we will dive uh, deeper into handovers in 5G. So that will be the structure of today's talk. And in between, I will give pauses so you can unmute your microphones and ask questions if you have any. So let's uh, take a high level view of what handover is. See, any cellular system, whether it's 2G or 3G or 4G, and currently we are in 5G, and uh, of course uh, 6G is going to come. So in any uh, uh, cellular system, the landscape or the geographical area is divided into small parts called cells. And when you are actually talking uh, to someone or you are downloading data from, let's say, you are streaming data from YouTube or you are on a live video call, so whether it's a voice or video or any kind of data transfer, you are downloading that from a certain location within that cell. So in uh, lay person's language, we call that a tower. So we say that my phone is connected to a tower. That's the lay person uh, you know, description of what is happening. Uh, so the, that's uh, basically a cell. But uh, the thing about uh, all the cellular system is the handset is mobile. So you could be in a car or a bus and you could be traveling. Which means that uh, you are connected to a particular cell, but as you move on that landscape, you will at some point you will become too far from the cell tower. So then uh, the quality of the data transfer or the call degrades. So what uh, so if no action is taken on this, the call will get dropped. So you will lose the connection with the network. So obviously we don't want that. That's where cellular networks have made an innovation. This is not something new. This was thought out in the 1970s and 1980s, right? When the first cellular networks came about. So what they figured out is when the handset is moving away from the cell tower, you have to hand over the call to the next tower, which, whichever is uh, uh, the closest tower. So that was the concept of handover. So you see here on this picture a description of that, right? So this is your handset. This is some entity in the network. We don't care about what UPF is at this moment. We'll introduce the jargon later. So the uh, you know the handset is connected through the tower to some entity within the network, and as it moves away from this particular uh, tower. The signal gets weaker and weaker. At some point, it is too weak to continue this connection. Then what the network decides? Network decides that I will hand over the connection from this particular tower to this tower. Right? So the connection gets handed over from tower on the left to the tower on the right. But what this uh, B here indicates is that the connection, uh, this indicates that the mobile is trying to establish connection with the new tower. So now there are two scenarios which can take place in a real network. Either this handover is successful, which means that this connection is totally destroyed, and then this is a very good connection. The call continues on the new tower, whichever is now the you know tower which is handling the call with the mobile. Then the second scenario is the handover is unsuccessful. That means you tried to hand over to the other tower, but the handover failed because this tower is also not that great. 
maybe there are trees in between the signal quality degraded so the mobile was not successful in handing over the call to the new tower so as a result what happens the mobile is neither connected to the old tower or the new tower this is the ca classic case of a call drop so as you are moving from one cell to a next you the network attempted to do a handover the mobile also obeyed the network commands it tried to do the handover but the handover failed and as a result you get a call drop so obviously call drops are very bad both from the user perspective point of view as well as the network uh, point of view and uh, this is something to be avoided and there have been many uh, you know kind of uh, upgrades or enhancements to the cellular standards to prevent this kind of a scenario so uh, from 2g right up to 5g many different types of enhancements have come about so that you can avoid the scenario of a uh, unsuccessful handover this is at a very high level is what handover is all about so anyone has a, any question at this point so we have covered what is handover purely from a lay person's perspective anyone has a, any question at this point no i mean, I mean they, they are places i mean in this in this world i guess i guess much smaller geographies where this problem doesn't exist would i be right in saying that smaller geographies so can you elaborate well, i mean you know like small smaller cities where which have a better network density or something like that where drops don't really happen so much yeah that is true uh, so, uh, it, see finally it depends on the operator how well he has covered mm -hmm. the landscape with the towers with cells exactly if right. the coverage is poor uh, then you know call drops can still happen there are many other mm -hmm. factors other factors mm -hmm. include for example too much load on a particular cell suppose mm -hmm. you are uh, it is an occasion like new year's eve or christmas eve and there is a particular venue which is a uh, lot of people are congregated at that particular venue so the nearest right. tower or towers in near that area will be overloaded correct so that is another situation where a call drop can happen because that particular tower is handling lot of traffic other uh, right. cases is where for example there is heavy rain so mm -hmm. rain translates to signal attenuation on the rf channel so when right. such conditions arise or for example uh, there are blind spots that means two cells are overlapping but in between those two cells there is a blind spot where uh, no tower is covering so that is another classic case of uh, you know call drops and uh, obstacles for example you are entering a nature reserve where there is a forest cover so their call drops are likely even though there may be a cell tower nearby but the signal doesn't penetrate well enough into the through the forest canopy or into the forest to the forest floor so there again because of coverage issues because of obstacles the call drop can have occur so there are many uh, situations uh, for call drops and, uh, so i mentioned a few of them so i mean so what when you talk about these these particular towers and then the, you know whatever the density might be then obviously the whole thing gets stored on a central repository isn't that correct like a, a server has got or a central place has got the whole record of you know this number is this person's this person and the tower then communicates all the towers then link to something central would that be correct Well, no it's a, it may be central it may be distributed that uh, there are different options in the network so well, it's that like the you know, server farm would that would that be right in saying a server farm the tower is not the place which finally the tower, the tower so we'll come which, uh, come, uh, come to those things a little okay, later sure, in the talk you. yeah okay, sure. any other questions i think we can move on okay so we uh, looked at this now before we move on to the details of handover let's uh, get a grip on some of the technical language so you can see here in this particular uh, figure this is architecture diagram of 5g uh, minor differences are there uh, with respect to 4g and 3g but basically this is uh, 
many there are equivalent uh, entities in the other networks 4G and 3G. So we'll take 5G as an example. And uh, in this example, if you see here, there is something called uh, E node B. Right? Forget about this NG and those things. So the basic thing we need to. Uh, OK, actually you can even forget about this. Let's only focus on this. So what we called as a tower, right? In technical lingo, we can call it as a base station. And uh, if you uh, base station is again a very generic term, it, it is a term which is applicable or used in uh, 2G, 3G, 4G and 5G. So what a lay person calls as a tower, we call it as a base station. And in 5G, we call it as a G node B. In 3G, in 4G, we call it as a E node B. Right. And in 3G, we simply call it as a node B. So these are the different terminologies in different technologies, but basically all of them can be called as a base station. And you have a mobile which wirelessly connects to the base station. That is the first thing. Mobile is not represented in this figure. The so mobile wirelessly connects to the base station, which is in 5G, a G node B. G node B in turn connects to what is known as the core network. So this green box on the right is the 5G core network. Okay. The uh, somebody has your mi microphone unmuted, kindly muted. So the green box on the left, uh, this is the radio access network. That means the part of the 5G network which manages the wireless channels and the resources on the wireless channel. So that is the radio access network part. Now the radio access network is connected to the core through a specific interface. Here it's generically named the NG interface, but uh, one of the entities uh, to which it connects is the AMF. Like this, there are so many entities, AMF and UPF. We will not get into the details at this point, but basically there are two parts, radio access network and the core network, and the G node B connects to some entity, one or more entities within the core network. So just now Radha Krishnan was asking, you know, where are these things stored? Uh, you know, mobile is connected to a particular G node B or associated with a particular AMF. So all this will be stored in different entities within the core network. And there will be some context maintained also in the G node B to which the mobile is connected. Now, when we say mobile, that is a very uh, uh, like an, it's not a tick. Uh, I mean, it's not in the standards. We don't usually say mobile. We use a specific name called UE, user equipment. So whenever you encounter this term UE in literature, it simply means the mobile handset. So that is the UE is the term which is very often used in uh, cellular standards. So UE stands for user equipment. It is nothing but your mobile handset. So UE connects to the G node B. G node B connects to some entity in the core network. And this is the overall architecture of uh, of the 5G network. Uh, now, given this architecture, the interesting thing is what is a handover? That is the question we want to understand, right? Handover is nothing but a UV, which is, let's say, connected to this G node B on top. Then it starts moving away from this G node B. At some point, the signal gets weaker and weaker. So the network decides that I want to hand over this mobile from this G node B to this G node B. So a command is sent from the source G node B to the mobile. And the mobile will initiate connection to the uh, other G node B, which is what we call as the target G node B. So the handover is now in progress. Then the, when the mobile finally connects to the target G node B, the connection with the source G node B is released. Likewise, in the network side, that is the 5G core side, whatever connection existed between the G node B and the 5G core network, for this particular UE, those things are transferred to the target G node B. Right? Because the 5G core also needs to update itself, saying that the UE which was previously connected to this G node B is now connected to the bottom G node B. So those contexts are transferred from uh, you know this connection, basically, this line gets transferred to this line in the simplest case. But there are so many different variations of handover, which uh, which is what we will try to understand next. So the next question is, what are the different types of handover? Now that we have understood 
the basics of handover and the basics of the architecture of the network. Now we are in a good position to understand the different types of handover. OK, so the first thing to understand is within the 5G core network. Right. There are many entities. One of the important entities is AMF. AMF stands for access and mobility function. So just by the name, you can make out that this is the entity which is in charge of the mobility of the UE. So as the UE moves from one cell to another, it is this AMF which coordinates the movement of the UE. So kind of the AMF decides whether the UE should be handed over. Right, whether handover should be triggered for this UE. So that is what uh, this whole thing is about. And you can see here different types of handover. Luckily, uh, somebody on the internet, uh, this company or startup Telco sort, they have produced this nice diagram, which helps us understand the different types of handover in a single picture. Right. So. Uh, Picture paints a thousand words, they say, which is very much true for this particular picture. So we'll start with the simplest case. So on the left, you see a simplest case where this G node B is connected to the UE, but from this G node B, there are multiple beams, right? So in other cases, you may call them as sectors, but uh, in 5G, we call them as beams because there is this uh, concept of beam forming also. So you have multiple beams from the same G node B coming out and UE is connected to the G node B on one particular beam. But U UE is um, always mobile. Let's say it is moving and somehow it is losing connect losing signal strength at a particular G uh, beam. So what the G node B decides, it decides that I will hand over this mobile from this beam to another beam. So this is what we can call as a intra G node B handover, or in some cases people may call that as inter beam handover. The concept is the same. All the handover is focused within the same G node B. So you can imagine here the handover is very simple because there is a not not a lot of work to be done from the uh, core side. So the handover is managed within the G node B. So this is kind of a simplest uh, type of handover. A more complex type of handover is what I showed you in the previous figure, where the handover is from one G node B to a, another G node B. So in this case, you know, let's say you are in Bangalore, you are uh, on the call where you are connected to a particular G node B in MG road. And you are traveling from MG Road, let's say uh, on uh, Richmond, uh, from MG Road, you are moving towards, let's say, Trinity Circle. From Trinity Circle, you are moving on Old Airport Road. At some point, your st signal strength with the MG Road G Node B is very weak. Then the network decides that I have to hand over this mobile from this G Node B to a G Node B on Old Airport Road. Now, luckily, it so happens that these two G node Bs are interconnected directly through something called as the XN interface. Right? So in this particular case, there exists a XN interface. So certain signaling which are necessary can happen directly on the XN interface. That means the context of this UE, which is stored in the source G node B, those contexts can be transferred to the destination G node B. And when this happens, when UE tries to connect to this G node B, this G node B is already ready because the context for this G node B uh, for this UE has been transferred on the XN interface. So this is what we mean by the network preparing itself for handling the handover from the UE. See, basically what happens when you have a handover, UE tries to connect to the target G node B. But target G node B must be ready. It must be expecting that this UE is going to connect. It will reserve certain radio resources for this UE. So how will this G node B know that this UE is trying to do a connection? So it will be informed from the source G node B through the XN interface. So that is the whole thing about uh, inter G node B. What do you call the inter G node B XN based handover? 
but there are some g node b's which there are some scenarios in where the source g node b and the destination g node b don't have the xn interface that is, that is to say they are not interconnected by the xn interface so this is an example right so let's say i was in mg road uh, g node b i moved to koramangala and it so happens that mg road g node b and uh, koramangala g node b don't are not interconnected via our xn interface they are only interconnected within the core network that means now the signaling has to go all the way up to amf which is an entity in the core network so now what source g node b will do it will get in touch with the amf it will say this is the context for the ue and ue is going to be handed over to this g node b the amf will then transfer the context on the end to interface to the target g node b then when our ue try to connect to the target g node b same procedure like in this g node b the only difference is context has been transferred via the end to interface because this particular target and source g node b's don't have the xn interface otherwise most of the procedures are the same for uh, xn and n2 the main difference is that here amf gets involved now we come to a more complex scenario where the same inter g node b uh, handover via the n2 interface takes place okay but here the complication is the target g node b is not connected to the same a amf as the source g node b so in the network in the 5g core network there are multiple amfs amf is not a single entity 5g core is a distributed architecture so uh, amf need not be a single entity it can be multiple entities each amf serving serving a certain section of g node b so it so happens in this handover scenario this g node b is connected to amf1 the target g node b is connected to amf2 now obviously uh, these two amfs have to communicate so the context must be transferred from source amf to the destination amf so this is what we call as the inter amf based handover and these two amfs themselves are connected via the n14 interface so this is again one more specialization of the inter g node b handover case so you can see different levels of handover xn based n2 based and then n14 based handover for the inter amf case so this is a basic overview of handovers in 5g but now there is one more handover which you will see on the right which is what we call as the n26 based handover and this is also very important even today it is a very and even uh, going for the next 2 uh, 3 years this type of handover is going to be very important and why is this so what you see on the left side is the 5g network but what you see on the right side that is mme and e node b this is the 4g network and uh, today this kind of a handover is likely to be common so let's say you are connected to a 5g network let's say in mg road there happens to be a good 5g coverage and you are on 5g network then you start moving let's say you are in a car you are driving you are moving towards koramangala it so happens that in koramangala the operator doesn't have good 5g coverage he has only 4g coverage now the network decides i have to hand over from 5g to 4g and the way to do this is again bring in n2 interface for the source g node b and transfer the context from 5g amf to 4g mme so in 4g we don't have an entity called amf but the equivalent entity is called mobility management entity so this kind of a handover takes place when you are handing over from 5g to 4g and of course vice versa let's say you are in koramangala you are connected to a 4g network and then you start moving towards uh, mg road where there is good 5g coverage so the network may decide let me transfer this call from 4g to 5g so this is again answering uh, you know radha krishnan's call uh, radha krishnan's point earlier sometimes you know just because you have good coverage 
in one area, the network may decide, let me hand over. Because it eases congestion on the 4G network and it used, utilizes the capacity on the 5G network, even though you know signal strength may still be good on the 4G network. So there are different reasons why a network will hand over. So N26, remember, it is to it is used for handovers between 5G network and 4G network. So this is the overview of the different types of handovers in cellular networks. Any questions at this point? So this yeah. gives a very good overview of handovers uh, from a high level perspective. Any questions at this point? Yeah, in case of N14 based handover. Uh, who is this? Uh, Abhishek. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah. So in case of N14 based handover, how AMF2 is uh, discovered by, NR, by using NRF or there is some other mechanism? Well, what is the question? Uh, in in case of N14 based handover, yeah, how, how AMF2 is discovered with the help from NRF or there is some other mechanism? Okay, okay. Uh, so the thing is, uh, within the 5G network, uh, see, first thing is the target G node B is fixed. So to answer that question, let us go back a little bit. So we have talked about handover, source G node B, target G node B. Now the real question is, how does the network know which is the target G node B? Anyone has an answer for this? Some of you may know, those, who have, those of you who are in telecom. So I just want to put out this question. See, we always talked about handover from source G node B to target G node B. And the decision to handover is taken by the network. Right? But how does the network know which is the target G node B? Because only the UE knows, right? How does the network know which is the target G node B? Anyone has the answer for this? Yeah, in that case, the UE sends a, a, a signal report of all the nearby uh, towers, and the source you know, source G node B decides that this would be the best target G node B based on signal strength and signal quality reported by the UE. Yes, yes, that's correct. Now I'll ask a further question. How does the UE know which are the neighboring cells? You mentioned UE is sending measurement reports of the neighboring cells. How does the UE know which are the neighboring cells? That is the second question. Anyone uh, has a clue on yeah. that? Yeah, it's uh, in the operator's those... perspective. All those ahead, uh, yeah. G, notes B, G notes B will be sending broadcast messages and uh, UE yeah. keeps on measuring the signal strength all the time, means uh, uh, at regular interval. Yeah, kind of uh, answer is correct, yes. Anyone else wants to add to that? It's all about the neighbor definitions. At all the neighbor, neighbor definitions, definitions uh, how does the UE get the neighbor definitions? That is my question. Through the SIB messages, you will receive the neighbor uh, relations defined in the part of the G node B or E node B. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the thing is, their answers are correct. So when a UE is connected to a okay. particular G node B, right? I this will. G node, yeah, go ahead. Somebody wants opinion. Sorry, um, uh, maybe, maybe. Is it something like it just doesn't even, is it something, something like there's some routing algorithm? based on who you're trying no, to No, no, uh, it is no, much simpler like that. than that. Uh, it's what, a much simpler than that. Okay. Yeah, the, what people in telecom, those who in telecom know the answer, they have already given the answer, two of them. Okay. So basically, right. so, so it's like a broadcast uh, source, and then the detection. Yeah, right. I'll explain it, uh, complete the answer. The, the, so this is sorry, the source G node B just, to which sorry, the UE is connected. And okay. every G node B will have some system information, which it will be broadcasting in the cell. And this system information contains information about the neighboring cells of this particular uh, G node B. So that means every G node B already is aware which are the neighboring cells. So the UE which is connected to the G node B is having the task of measuring the signal strength, uh, different ways of measuring, different parameters to measure. It will always be measuring the neighboring cells of the current G node B. So these neighboring cell measurement reports are sent 
regularly or at specific, depending on the configuration, they are sent to the network. And based on these measurements, the network decides when to trigger the handover. OK, this is the fundamental point. So now coming back uh, to Abhishek's question, when reports are received you know, by the network, in this case, his question was, you are handing over from 4G to 5G. So reports are received by the 4G network through the E node B. And these reports will contain uh, which are the neighboring uh, G node Bs on which the signal is good. So now the MME will decide, you know, uh, I will, uh, uh, MME will decide, let me trigger the handover to a particular G node which is having good signal strength for this UE. Then this G node B is associated with a particular AMF. So the association is already known within the 5G network. So Abhishek's question was how the AMF is decided, whether it's AMF 1 or 2. So that is configured within the 5G network because first you select the so a target G node B and from there, if you go back, you will find which is the associated AMF. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, which which uh, network element, um, I mean network function contains this information like G node B1 is connected with AMF1, G node B2 is connected with AMF2. Where those information resides? Which network function? Uh, that level of detail, I don't know. Uh, probably you, you have to search the standards to figure out that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Just a little question. So let's say you, you're talking about 5G and 4G coexisting. So let's say, I mean, previously there was 3G, 3G, then moved to 4G, and now there's 5G. So let's say a system of grades to 5G and some amount is left over. Uh, at the max, do you feel that, like, let's say there's 3G to 4G it moved, right? So at the max, 4G gets upgraded, and some of them are 3G or something like that. That sort of thing can coexist. Is that correct? Yeah, what is the question? No, no, no. What I'm saying here is, let's say there was 3G first, right, a long time ago. And then yeah. it became 4G, right? So when you when you upgrade to 4G, now before 3G there was 2G. So when you upgrade to 4G, not if, what you're saying here in this scenario is 4G can exist and there's some amount of 3G with some amount of 3G. Is that correct? Or, or, or 5G can exist with some amount of 4G. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, but 5G at the max you can have a 5-4 combo and not a 5-4-3. Uh, that is very rare. Even if you, okay. uh, I mean, uh, no operator will have all three in place. Right. But even if you have all three in place, you have you can only hand over 5G to, I mean, typically 5G to 4G, 4G to 3G. That is the typical way people will do handover. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on. So we covered uh, XN based handover, uh, N2 handover, N14, N26. Uh, now let's look at the basic handover scenario as uh, visualized through a message sequence chart, right? This is what in telecom we call the message sequence chart or MSC. So you have so now you see how useful it is to know the technical jargon because most of the documents online or in the standards will be using this jargon. So UE, which is our handset, source G node B, which is nothing but source tower, target G node B, target tower, AMF, which is the entity in the core network handling mobility of the UE. Then UPF. UPF stands for user plane functions. So wherever, whenever the data is being sent, that data is handled by user plane function. So AMF is not handling the data. AMF handles only the signaling, that is managing the handover and many other features AMF has. But data that you send, suppose you are uh, streaming data from YouTube or you are on a voice call, that data doesn't go through you, AMF. It goes through another entity in the core network called the UPF. Right, which is connected to your internet and other providers. 
So that entity is called user plane function. So that that is also shown in this diagram. If you take a overview of the entire handover process, it can be viewed in three phases. The first phase is called handover preparation. Second phase handover execution and the last is handover completion. So it happens in three phases. So let's uh, look at uh, briefly what, what are these three phases. Handover preparation is when. OK, let, it's easier. Let's go through the flow. You will understand. So you see here data is being transferred between UE and the network through the UPF. And uh, as we discussed earlier, you know, UE is sending measurement reports to the so through the source G node B to the network. Now the decision to do a handover is not with the UE. It is never with the UE. It is the network which always decides that a handover has to be done. But UE assists this definition by providing measurement reports of the neighbors, neighboring cells. So UE is providing this measurement reports. At some point, G node B will decide. And that is the network source G node B will decide. OK, I'm going to do a handover. Now, before informing the UE that a handover is going to be done, it has to prepare the target G node B as we discussed earlier. So this is what is known as the handover preparation stage. So it sends a message to the target G node B handover request. Target G node B will do something called admission control. What if the target G node B is already overloaded? There are hundreds of users already connected on the target G node B. It may not be able to handle any more UEs. So in this case, it will reject a handover. But we are showing here a nominal case where admission control succeeds. So it will send a response back to the source G node B that OK, I'm ready to accept this UE. So it will give handover request acknowledge. Then the source G node B says OK. I have prepared the target G node B. Now I can initiate the handover with the UE. So this is the point at which the UE gets the message that you know I need to hand over. So then this is what is known as the handover execution. So handover execution starts when the UE gets involved. OK. So handover execution starts uh, and what happens at the UE side? UE actually detaches from the old cell and it synchronizes to the new cell. And uh, it starts to uh, initiate communication with the new cell. So when we say new cell, it is between UE and the target G node B. So this itself has many multiple stages inside. Here all the details are not shown. They have just clubbed everything as handover initiation and completion. But because it's a radio access network, there are many messages flowing between UE and the target G node B. Because you see the UE has many layers, physical layer, MAC layer, RLC, PDCP and so on. So at each layer something happens. But ultimately UE will uh, achieve a connection with the target G node B. And at that point we say handover has been completed from the UE perspective, right? So this is handover execution. But the network is not yet done with the handover. Network still has work to do because source need G node B is still there. It is still having some context associated with the UE. Source G node B has no idea that UE has successfully managed the handover with the target G node B. OK, because uh, UE, once it receives the handover command, it is trying to talk to the target G node B. It, it is no longer actively communicating with the source G node B. So this is where the handover completion stage kicks in. So what this does is the target G node B now initiates communication with the source G node B. It says handover is successful for this UE. Now the source G node B recognizes, OK, handover is done. And it will send something called uh, sequence number status transfer. This is some uh, detail which we will not go through. So it will give this command to the target G node B. This is the point when all the user data now starts flowing from the target G node B. Source, source G node B is no longer actively involved in sending user data to the UE. 
because now handover has been completed both from the UE perspective as well as from the network perspective, now user data can flow from the UPF right up to the UE through the target G0B. So this completes the handover procedure. There are other procedures like path switch request and so on, which because of time limit, we will not go through these things today. Okay. Overall, this is the nature of handover, uh, the call flow. So three stages, preparation, execution, where the UE is actively involved, and finally, completion. So in uh, preparation and completion, it's mainly the network. Preparation is where you are uh, allocating resources and setting up the target G node B. Completion is where you are releasing resources from the source G node B and doing some cleanup on the source G node B. So that is what uh, completion is all about. Okay, so these are the three stages of handover and this is the call flow. The call flow we have discussed is for one particular case where you know there is a single AMF. So it's an intra AMF handover. N14 interface is not involved and uh, N26 interface is not involved. That is to say, both source and uh, target are within 5G domain. But you can imagine the procedure is more or less similar when you go to other handover scenarios. Okay, they are more or less similar. Uh, except that you will have extra lines. So if you talk about N14 handover, you will have source AMF, destination AMF. And likewise, if there is N16, N26, you will have one more line for MME and E node B and so on. Okay, but otherwise, uh, these things are the same. So we have 15 minutes. Uh, I have a couple of more concepts to cover, but any questions at this point? Okay, no questions. We'll move on. So the next slide, next uh, topic is quite interesting. Even if the handover is successful, you can drop, you can lose packets. I mean, uh, some of you might have experienced this. You are on a call. You are traveling. The call is not. The call doesn't get dropped. But during the call, sometimes uh, you will lose. The, uh, the voice will break for maybe one second, couple of seconds, or if you are doing a, I don't know, if you are doing a live video streaming session, then you may see buffering of the video. So what is happening here? So this is a simulation result. And even in a real network, something like this will happen. So you can see here, this yellow line is nothing but the throughput in Mbps, and it can be mapped to the signal strength. So you can see your handover gets initiated uh, at some point, but as the UE moves away from the source G node B, throughput continue, uh, starts to drop, right? And once handover is successful, throughput increases. This is your all the UE is connected to the target G node B. So at this point, throughput starts to increase. But between the source G node B and the target G node B, there will be some time where the UE is uh, unable to uh, send traffic or receive traffic from the network because the signal is so poor. That is one thing. And second thing is, you see, there is some uh, gap between the uh, connect uh, dropping the connection from the. So you see here, this part part is represented as a single box. You are detaching from the old cell and synchronizing and connecting to the new cell. But this box is not as simple or trivial as it is represented here. Between disconnecting and uh, con uh, connecting to the new cell, there is some gap. And this gap is, is in the order of uh, milliseconds. So in uh, uh, in real time, in real network measurements, this has been reported as uh, 45 milliseconds, as uh, sometimes 60 milliseconds, and in some cases, it can also be hundreds of milliseconds, maybe 100, 200 milliseconds. So in that short time gap where you are neither connected to the old or the new, 
you have what is known as the handover interruption time. And this is what the user perceives as a break in the voice call or buffering for a live video stream. So this is very bad uh, for the network as well as from the user perspective. So the question really is how to avoid this. So for this, they have invented lots of techniques. One of the technique is called conditional handover. Uh, I don't have any description or uh, diagram for that, but for conditional, uh, but I'll explain it uh, in a very simple manner. It's uh, easy to understand. See, we, we know that uh, network is, uh, UE is sending reports, right? UE is sending reports to the network. And based on these reports, the network decides that uh, it is time to hand over the UE to a target uh, G node B. But see, the report was measured by the UE at some time in the past. And it takes time for the UE to report this measurement to the network. Then the network has to prepare the target G node B and then send the command to the UE. So there is a big gap here between one and six. six. And in this gap, network conditions can change, especially on 5G. If you are on a, if the cell is small and you are moving fast and the cell is, let's say it's a FR2 cell. That means you are in a very, uh, that is a millimeter wave band. So conditions can change very quickly. So between the time you send the measurement report and you receive the handover command from the network, condition uh, could have changed drastically. So the command says, you know, handover to target G node B, but it so happens that by the time you receive the handover command, the condition with the target G node B is quite poor. You are not able to hand over properly with the target G node B. Or for that matter, uh, conditions with the source G node B could have improved, right? That is also there. So uh, what conditional handover does is, Handover command is sent to the UE, but along with the condition saying that under these conditions only you have to hand over. If these conditions are not met, you can continue with the source G node B. So this gives the UE a little bit more flexibility. That means it is not a hard decision that once the UE receive, receives the handover command, it is forced to hand over. This is how handover was previously. But with conditional handover, this uh, thing is improved. That is handover only if the certain condi conditions are met. So this gives uh, more uh, real-time uh, adjustment for the UE, which means that ultimately, finally, what it translates to the user, this handover interruption time is minimized. So it is reduced uh, to a certain uh, acceptable level and not only that uh, the chance of a call drop is actually less because now uh, if conditions have improved in the source cell or conditions are pretty bad in the target cell you may avoid an unnecessary handover right so call drops are also uh, like reduced uh, with this kind of a scenario so this is the condition of a, this is what we mean by conditional handover then the second concept which I want to cover is DAPS handover. So I did not write about this here. I will be covering this here, but it so happens that we have a dedicated article on Devopedia for DAPS handover. So we look at this particular article. So DAPS handover is pretty interesting and it reduces the interruption time to zero milliseconds. Imagine that. Right uh, now with the DAPS handover, it is possible that you don't lose any packets during handover. So how is this achieved? So this is achieved uh, by maintaining two stacks on, at the UE side. So typically, you know, this is say a source G node B. This is your destination G node B, target G node B. Then on the UE, you have these layers, PDCP, RLC, MAC and physical layer. Right, this is the upper layer. This is the lowest layer, layer one. Now, what happens in the case of uh, DAPS? DAPS stands for dual active uh, protocol stack. 
So in the case of dApps, the UE maintains two layers of the stack, one layer with the source G node B and one layer with the target G node B. And as described here, transmission of uplink PDCP data packets until random access completion in the target cell. So until, see, although the UE receives the handover command from the network, it will continue to send and receive on the source cell. And while sending and receiving data from the source G node B, it will also attempt to initiate connection on the target G node B. So during the handover uh, time frame, which we say, you know, uh, 60 milliseconds or let's say even few hundred milliseconds, the UE will maintain two pro protocol stacks, one for the source and one for the target, which means that uh, no data will get lost. Now you may ask uh, what happens to data coming from the core network to the source G node B. You see, before handover command is sent to the UE, the network has already prepared the target G node B. And now downlink packets are coming from the UPF. What will this G node B do with the UPF? First thing it will send those to the UE, right? This uh, source G node B will send those packets to the UE, but it will also forward these packets to the target G node B. Because uh, the network source G node B will not know exactly when target G node B gets connected to the UE. So it will also forward the packets to the target G node B. So at some point during this handover, UE will receive packets from both source and target, but it doesn't matter because at PDCP layer, both these stacks share the same PDCP uh, entity. So duplicated PDCP packets will get discarded in the UE side. So this is the beauty of TAPS handover. Now you may say this is all great, but what is the cost? Cost is that now UE has to maintain two protocol stacks. Okay. So the implementation is a little bit complex uh, and it will be more complex under certain scenarios. We will not go into that. But a lot of uh, information related to dApps is in this particular article, which goes into detail of uh, how dApps handover works. So overall dApps handover comes under a group of handover called make before break. Right? You, some of you in telecom would have heard this terminology, make before break. So as the name indicates, before you break the connection with the old G node B, uh, source G node B, you actually make the connection with the target. And only after that, you break the connection. Right? So it sounds very simple, uh, make before break. But there is a point of confusion uh, in the terminology. Actually, if you look at LTE, I don't know how many of you in telecom are aware of this. In 4G LTE, there is another handover called make before break handover. There is a subtle difference between MBB and DAPS, right? So in LTE, uh, 4G LTE, make before break was introduced in release 14. Then in release 16, LTE also introduced DAPS handover. So you see in LTE, there are two types of handover, make before break and DAPS, and there is a subtle difference between them. In 5G, uh, of course, we don't have make before break. We only have DAPS handover. So there is no confusion in 5G. So now you may ask, obviously, in 4G, what is the difference between make before break and DAPS? And the answer is not. Uh, explicitly stated, only those who have read the standards deeply will know this. So the main difference is this. It is summarized in this paragraph. The main difference is in the case of MBB, once uplink transmission is achieved on the target cell, the UE will autonomously break the connection with the source. So the decision to break the connection with the source E node B is with the UE, right? That is all make before break is all about. But in DAPS, that is not the case. UE can release the source connection only after a command is given by the target G node B. So in the case of DAPS, 
the command has to come from the network before UE can release the connection from, from the source cell. This is the fundamental and main difference between TAPS and uh, MBB in uh, LT. There are other differences which I have pointed out in this paragraph. See, make before break is actually simple because UE doesn't have to maintain two protocol stacks. Right, as soon as it connects to the target, it can get rid of the source, all the resources of the source cell. Like it can break the connection from the source uh, E node B. But uh, that is not the case with the uh, DAPS. DAPS has to maintain both. So because of this, DAPS has certain restrictions. For example, some of you might have heard the term dual connectivity. So this is again another feature of uh, both 4G and 5G. We have covered this extensively last year. So the talk is recording of the talk is there on our YouTube channel. Just take a look. So when dual connectivity is involved, then you cannot invoke DAPS. Right? Dual connectivity cannot be used alongside DAPS. Because now uh, if you do that, then the implementation becomes more, more complex. Because let's say dual connectivity, you are already connected to two cells. And uh, that means already there are multiple stacks running on the UE. On top of that, if you do DAX, DAPS, it becomes complex from an implementation perspective. So in the current release, DAPS along with dual connectivity is not allowed. But dual connectivity with MBB is allowed in LTE. So you can have make before break along with the dual connectivity. And there is also another type of handover called a rashless uh, handover, which we will not discuss today because of uh, time. But this is also possible along with MBB, but you can't do a rashless handover with DAPS. So there are certain restrictions in, on how you can use DAPS. And uh, one more restriction is, uh, you know, here, for example, uh, you cannot do Inter-RAD taps. So earlier we talked about N26 handover. What is N26? You are handing over from 4G to 5G, 5G to 4G. That is inter-RAD. But you cannot combine inter-RAD handover with taps. That is currently not supported. Another limitation is taps from FR2 to FR2. That means both are millimeter wave spectrum. That is both in the source. G node B as well as in target G node B. So in such a situation, DAPS is not supported. So there are some limitations. But not to worry, some of these limitations are going to be addressed in release 18. So people are currently working on release 18 and it is going to come out maybe in March or in June uh, 2024. So we are just few months away from release 18. So when release 18 comes out, some of these limitations of TAPS will be removed. So that is another thing I want to point out to you, right? So more information on TAPS is available on this page. And we'll conclude with this diagram of TAPS. So you can see here, this is the representation of TAPS in PDCP. See, I just showed you this diagram earlier. So I showed you this diagram where you have a dual protocol stack on the UE, where PDCP layer is shared between both the source as well as the target cells. But if you zoom into this layer on the UE side, this is what you will see. So there is a transmit side which has duplication here. You can see this thing is duplicated. And that is because this is for source, this is for target. Similarly, on the receive side, it is duplicated. This is for the source, this is for the target. And like I said, uh, well, on the target side, UE will decide routing. What is routing? It will basically decide whether to send the packet to the source uh, cell or to the target cell. That is what, and there are uh, clear uh, criteria mentioned in the standard, how the UE is supposed to do this routing. Then on the receive side, that means downlink packets, which UE is receiving. As I mentioned earlier, UE might receive same packet from both the source as well as the target cells. 
So then it will do the proper reordering and it will discard duplicates. Because PDCP has this feature of dupli uh, discarding duplicates. So this is how the whole thing is uh, within the PDCP layer. So you see PDCP plays an important role uh, when it comes to TAPS handover. So this concludes our talk and we are also doing good on time. So we can probably take five minutes to address any questions that you guys may have. Uh, yeah, Arvind. Uh, yeah, so Abhishek, go ahead. Part, in the second part, that is handover execution. Yeah. When the UE is successfully connected with the target G node B. Here we see that the downlink packets are coming from user plane function to source G node B and finally to the target G node B. And then yeah. that is delivered to the user equipment. This is the direction of downlink packet. Now uplink packets will go from UE to the target G node B. Yeah. Now from here, uh, where the uplink packets will go? From target G node yeah, that, to the plane function or yeah. via uh, source G node B. You are asking about downlink packets or uh, uplink packets? Uh, uplink packets. Uplink packets, that is, UE has sent all those packets to the target G node B. UE has sent the packets to the target G node B. Yes. Uh, so yeah. here, yeah. handover is completed. Yeah, yeah. So, right. what, uh, so you what see this. UE is sending packets to the target G node B. Right. Right. And from and the so target G node B, it goes to the UPF. Okay. Not via source G node B. No, no. Handover has been completed. Yeah. It will not, once handover is completed, yeah, UE will not send uh, packets to the source G node B. Source G node B context, uh, it will only communicate with the target G node B. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Radha no, Krishnan, no. your hand is up. Anything you want to ask? Well, it's nothing about the content, something about uh, something else, but not very complicated. Okay. I mean, can I do that? Yeah, let me uh, go ahead. Do you, uh, have any con do you have any contacts in the UK? Do you know any people in the UK? Oh, those kind of questions that uh, we'll come back to that later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions pertaining to handover? Okay. No questions. Good. Uh, so Radha Krishnan, you can uh, catch up with me uh, offline via email or LinkedIn. We can discuss yes, on sir. that. Yeah. Yeah. Arvin, I will do that. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. So let me conclude by showing the articles on uh, Devopedia. So this article on 5G handover, uh, I just started it today. I didn't have time to finish it before this talk. So I will be uh, completing this article and publishing it uh, maybe by Saturday or Sunday. So after that, uh, you can uh, go into depth of uh, 5G handover. The article on DAPS handover is already published, so you can read about that. Then there is another uh, very relevant article called uh, 5G UE measurements and reporting. See, your measurements and reporting is very intimately tied to handovers because it is the measurements and reporting which triggers the handovers. So those of you who want to have a complete understanding of handover, you are encouraged to read this article as well which talks about uh, UE measurements and reporting. Then uh, we also looked at dual connectivity briefly. Like we said, uh, dual connectivity cannot be used alongside the taps, although it can be used in LTE along with uh, make before break handover. So for those of you who want to understand dual connectivity better, you can read this article. Apart from this, there is going to be one more article which is the N26 based handover. So that I will write uh, next week. So by uh, mid of next week, we'll have a bunch of articles pertaining to handover on Devopedia website. So I hope uh, these articles will give you a very comprehensive view of handover in uh, 
not only 5G but also in 4G, right? And obviously, you know, it's easier to read all this stuff on Devopedia rather than going through the standards because standards, the information is very much distributed and it's not uh, easy to understand. Particularly like this particular thing, what is the difference between MBB handover and DAPS handover in 4G? This is not easy to understand uh, because it's not explicitly mentioned. So you, so you have to like go through the standard with almost with a fine tooth comb to figure this out. So yes, thanks for your questions, uh, especially Abhishek and Radha Krishnan. It was quite interactive.